presentation on intellectual properties and defense strategies. Uh, my name is Luke Clare. I'm the Regional Manager of Business Development for the Ottawa Office of Gowling WLG. Um, many of you likely are familiar with the name Gowling and uh, this past February we added the WLG when we combined with the UK firm of Reg Lawrence Graham. And Gowling WLG is now a global 100 legal practice with more than 1400 professionals and a range of business support teams working to deliver world-class world legal advice across 18 cities in the UK, Canada, continental Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. So I want to get started. Uh, we have some great content and information to provide to you this morning. And uh, I also would like to get everyone out of here by nine. So, um, so we're going to get started. So a quick introduction of our speakers. Michael Crichton um, is a partner with the Gowling WLG Ottawa office. Michael has well over a decade of experience as an intellectual property litigator and strategic advisor. Both his domestic and international clients consist of companies engaged in a wide range of technologies including mechanical, electrical, computer hardware and software, manufacturing, fabrication, communications and related technologies. In the evenings and on weekends, Michael Crichton is an accomplished novelist writing a number of highly successful fictional novels including Jurassic Park, The Andromedan Strain and The Lost World. Do you get that joke a lot? Every day. Although I found out yesterday that, that that Michael Crichton is actually dead. Yeah, so not as funny, but, but still funny for 8 a.m., I think. Um, Mark Spriggins is going to kick things off, and Mark focuses on patent and industrial design procurement with an emphasis on drafting and strategic advice for companies ranging from startups to large corporations and universities. He is also the co-chair of Ottawa's tech, uh, of o o the Auto Office's tech group. Um, I did Google Mark's name last night, and there are no famous people with that name, so I have no joke for you. And we'll kick things off, Mark. Okay. So I, I promise to be fairly quick. Hopefully I won't rush through it too quickly, because uh, Mike has a lot to say as well. Uh, I'm going to start with a bit of an introduction to general concept of IP and, and what, what you can protect. I'm going to focus on patents because obviously it's the most important thing to me and I think Mike would agree probably the most important aspect of protecting your IP. But you do have a number of different ways of protecting your IP and your company. Uh, patents, industrial designs, trademarks, copyrights and trade secrets sort of in order of complexity and importance. Industrial design patents are, uh, are a variant of patents. In the US they are called design patents and they protect the look and appearance of your product. Uh, patents protect the utility and function of your product. And these are all pieces of the portfolio. Some may cover your, your technology and your, your product better than others. So what is a patent? A patent is a bargain that you strike with the government. And the whole intent there is that you are going to provide disclosure of what your technology is for the public good with the eventuality that someone else will use it after the 20 year period. And the rapid, in, rapid change of technology now, that 20 years is a long time, so you have to move through it pretty quick. Um, you want to describe the implementation, operation of the invention, and you want to apply the disclosure that's for the public good itself. What it does is it provides you the right to exclude others. However, that right is not inherent. You have to enforce that right. You have to hire someone like Michael here to enforce that right. Uh, you want to have it cover what your product is going to be, and how you're going to sell it and who might infringe it. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. The big thing that people miss is that what the patent provides or the protection is provided is defined by the claim. So when you see an article on the web saying Apple has patented a new feature to do uh, a face recognition or something like that, most times people are just reading the abstract or they're reading the, looking at the pictures. They're not really getting what the protection is. Um, and there's a lot of uproar saying Apple's getting coverage for certain things and that's not necessarily true. The Patent Office is very good at narrowing your protection and you have to really look at the claims to know what you're really actually getting in terms of protection of that patent itself. The big thing to remember is that patents are country specific. There is not a global patent. There is not a, a unitary patent in, in any way. There is move towards unitary patents in certain countries. Uh, there has been talk for ages about having a North American patent. There's no sign of that's going to happen. In Europe, they are moving towards a European patent, but again, protection has to be done in each country. You do not have protection everywhere just because you have a patent. If someone says, I have a patent, you say where, and where the products are is, is de de um, depending on what protection you have on each country. 
So what are the business benefits? Uh, IP, and particularly patents, are an asset. They define your technology that you have. Uh, you have to have, if you, depending on your business, if you're selling a product that is unique, you have some IP, you have an asset. If you don't enact a strategy to protect that IP, someone else will enact that strategy on you. So you want to be ahead of the game. Uh, you want to have a strategy of how you're going to, how you're going to build your, your, your assets, build your patents, and how to leverage it to go ahead. To move forward with it. Big thing about patents is they show industry leadership. Sometimes it's a marketing tool. Sometimes it gives you the ability to show that you have something unique over other people and other companies, um, and it and it's part of your whole portfolio that you have to leverage. This just to give you an idea of of companies that deem patents important and IP important. IBM uh, last year received seventy three hundred and fifty five patents issued. For 23 years running, they have been the biggest, uh, uh, they've been the number one receiver of patents from the USPTO. They see value in generating this IP and leveraging it. Um, IBM, uh, I think about now, the last reported number is they generate 1.2 billion in revenue just from their patents alone. So they have a strategic division in how they manage the patents. And if you look at all these companies, you'd say, yeah, they're all innovative. They all have different strategies of how they leverage their patents. Uh, Google doesn't necessarily enforce it, they're more defensive. Microsoft um, is in the top 10 list. Uh, a couple years ago, it was they generate $2 billion a year on Android phones. They have nothing on Android. They generate it all from the IP licensing. It has decreased over time, but they made more money from Android phones than a lot of companies that were making the phones themselves. So how do you use your patents? Uh, they are a tool that you use in different ways. The biggest one is the barrier for competition. If you've got a product that is unique, you, you have a patent and you want to exclude others from using it, you have that patent and you stop others in terms of litigation or uh, they get concerned you might, you might sue them. Uh, generating licensing income, if you have a patent that you see value uh, in terms of the market and you might be able to generate more money in terms of licensing, for example, what Microsoft does, what Qualcomm does, you use it as a, you give everyone access to it. Uh, the last one is defensive cross-licensing. This is very big in the wireless market. Uh, pretty much all the cell phone companies and manufacturers cross-license. They say, I've got a thousand, you got a thousand. Instead of fighting, we'll cross-license. Uh, Samsung and Apple uh, decide to fight it out. At some point, there will be some cross-licensing deal because they'll sue each other on different ones. The biggest thing that's not here uh, is how do you use patents is, is uh, I've tried to find an analogy to finding of what a patent is. And it's hard to describe to the layman actually how you use this legal document. The best one I've been able to come up with is it's insurance. Uh, it's insurance, it's your house insurance, it's your car insurance, uh, uh, it's your home insurance. And it's, it's protection that you have that you may never use. You may use it all the time, but at the end of the day, you're not on your, you don't go to your wife saying, I, I wish I used your, my life insurance on you and, you're, and, I, and I cashed out on it. So if you have a, a year where you don't use your car insurance, you don't use your life insurance, you say, that's a good year. I had it in place just in case. But if you do have a, an eventuality and you don't have that insurance, that's when you run into trouble. So um, you may not necessarily use these. You may have it as, as an asset in the background, but it has to be there to, to have it and leverage it. I have a number of clients who have fairly large portfolios, and I've talked to them about enforcing it and how they want to use it. And they've actually point blank said, we do not want to enforce it. We think this is keeping people away from us. So the more IP we have, we keep people away from us because there are costs involved and that's part of your strategy of figuring out how you want to actually leverage your patents going forward. So th uh, this is sort of a, a quick run through of the patent process. Uh, it, it's, it's a long process, but it, from my perspective, this is where I come in. Uh, Michael comes in after here. So information gathering is the key one and that's something where you really have to strategize internally, which I'll talk about a bit more later. But getting the right information, knowing what your potential inventions are and what your IP, are, uh, IP is, is really important to, to figure out. Uh, there are a number of steps that you want to do internally to capture that. The worst thing you have is that when you figure out something after the fact was really important and you could have, could have really leveraged it and you've already missed the, the dates that you can actually file applications. I think that's where I come in. That's the preparation of the application. That's the preparation of the claims and the drawings. Uh, we then file, and filing, uh, as I said, is country dependent. You have to have decisions on where you want to file, what countries you want to file, and there's a whole strategy around that as well because filing is very expensive. You could file a patent in, in pretty much every country in the world, but uh, there's no, com no company that actually does that just because of the sheer cost of it. 
once you file, each country does examination. Uh, examination, like a lot of uh, government processes, can be very slow. Examination can take from 12 months to three years to, in some cases, we've seen 10 years on some files. So that's when you negotiate the claims with the patent office. You, you negotiate the bargain with the government as to what your patent is going to cover. Once you come out of examination, it might be positive, it might be negative. Hopefully it's positive. You have a granted patent. Once you have a gra granted patent, you have claims that you can enforce. Those claims define what your protection is for your invention. Then you have an actual asset within your company that you can then leverage, you can sell, you can license. So you have, you have something afterwards that you can use. So patentability. Uh, what does the patent office look for to get uh, to grant you a patent? And there's, there's sort of uh, three things. The first one is it has to be useful. And you sort of say, well, that's kind of obvious. If I'm going to file something, it's going to be useful. You'd be surprised by the number of times we get people coming to us with non-useful inventions. Uh, usually small inventors, usually not companies, uh, but it does happen that there are, are, are non-useful inventions. The big ones, the big test that the patent office apply is, is novelty and, and obviousness. So it has to be new and, and non-obvious. So new basically means one reference can't uh, anticipate your invention. So uh, if the patent office finds something that says your exact same thing or they find a product that's exactly the same, that would be anticipating it. Non-obvious is the challenge. Uh, and that's the non-obvious can be the examiner can take one or more references, put it together and say, hey, if I were someone skilled in the art, I would, I would see you as being obvious. So we'll add features together. It must not be previously disclosed. So in Canada, there is an exception. Uh, in, in Europe, you have absolute novelty. You cannot have disclosed an invention before you file it. So you have to have absolute novelty. You can't have made it public. You can't have done anything that's not under a non-disclosure agreement. So if you put a, a publication on your website of your invention that may be enabling, you can't file. You're, you can file in Europe. You just won't have a valid patent afterwards. In Canada and the U.S. and a number of other countries, you have a one-year grace period for your own public disclosure. So if you go to a trade show and you disclose your invention, you have one year before that disclosure will come back and cause a problem for you. You just have to be aware of that. Ideally, you file before there are any disclosures. Um, in companies, the marketing, the drive for marketing versus the drive of engineering is, is a very hard balance to challenge and you've got to make sure that you know when things are being disclosed to keep track of it. The worst case scenario is, is that you file an application, you get it issued, you go to court, and it turns out someone fi finds a publication that you, you filed, your whole invention's out out the door and your litigation is pretty short because you don't have a valid patent. So the way to understand obviousness is that it changes over time. When you have a pioneering technology, so for example Thomas Edison when he invented the light bulb, he was the first one that figured it out. He could file a very broad patent of the light bulb because no one had thought of it before. But over time as technology develops, the the the, the obviousness of, of something will get narrower and narrower as more references or prior art come out into the field. So over time, your examination with the patent office can get more difficult because you become more obvious. So you have to be more innovative. You have to be more pioneering to get over that obviousness leap. Um, Edison, uh, for example, had 2,332 patents to his name. So you like to think at the time he had a lot of opportunity in terms of he could find a lot of things that no one had and that weren't obvious to the patent office. The main part of the patents are the claims. They are the crux of the patent. They define the legal bounds. They give you the right, exclude, right to exclude others from making, using, or selling um, only those things which are disclosed by the claims. The, the language, they are run-on sentences. The language can be complex. Uh, and we spend a lot of time arguing over interpretation of words that seem very simple to people. Uh, litigators like figuring out different meanings to words. And, and that's the, the, the part where we, we, our value comes in in defining what those claims are. They are jurisdiction dependent, more or less. Uh, usually, you can adapt a lot of claims between countries, but there has to be there are variations between countries that you have to have to cover, and they're enforced by the courts for the most part. Um, in some countries, for example, the U.S., uh, they have the uh, International Trade Commission, and in the U.S., you can actually get a judgment from the International Trade Commission to block importation of infringing products of your patents. So it's not quite the same as as court proceedings that you can. Canada, I believe, with uh, customs, there is now a way to enforce uh, importation of certain products if you can get a ruling. Yeah. Trademark. yeah. Trademark. 
So what types of claims you have? These are just sort of a, a, some of the types of claims, the big ones that you have. So you have an apparatus, system, method, composition. You want to cover your invention through different means. And you want to describe it different ways because they have uh, value in different ways. So for example, a method of manufacture, that type of claim might be valuable where the product's being made. So maybe in China, maybe in a factory. But if the product's coming into Canada and it's not actually manufactured here, it's not as valuable. In that case, it will be the actual apparatus claim which defines the structure of it. Um, or a system claim if it's a, a telecommunication network that someone's going to uh, install. The issue with the claims is you want to figure out who is going to be infringing it and what type of claim you need to enforce that down the road. So it may not be your direct competition that's going to be infringing. It might be a distributor, it might be a store, it might be a supplier. I had an example a number of years ago, not a personal example, I was at a conference and they were talking, uh, um, talking about um, uh, a faucet manufacturer and basically he was saying that they went to Home Depot and they saw their faucet and they saw another faucet by another brand of the exact faucet right next to it. So they couldn't figure out what was going on so they, they didn't want to sue their customer because they could have sued their customer, they wanted to find out who was actually manufacturing it. So they ended up going back to, to China and found a city called, basically it was called Fawcett City, and there was their factory, and right next to it was another factory that had taken the molds and was manufacturing it. So in that case, they had manufacturing claims in China that they could enforce, as opposed to enforcing in the US. So the claims change over, over the examination period. What you go in with in terms of your claim structure will change as you go through with the examination and they adapt over, over the life of, of the examination process. So um, you have to be open to it, you have to be cognizant of what, as, as market changes, as I said, the, the um, patent process is a long process. So as the market changes, you have to be willing to adapt these claims until they issue. Once they issue, they're locked in, you, you have what you have. So where do you find your innovation? Where do you find your patents from? Hopefully you find most of your innovation internally. R&D is sort of an obvious this one, but you can get innovation, you can get patents from other parts of the business. So salespeople may have ideas that, that are you can leverage with. A big one that a lot of companies I find miss is uh, product releases. A lot of times I'll get notification from a client that a product is about to go out, and the first question is, did you scrub the product for IP to see if there's something there? A lot of times they don't think about that because they've been working with so long, they forget what the innovation was. So it's really important that you build processes in place to identify parts of your product that may be innovative and make sure you capture that technology and make sure that you get protection around it before it's too late. Uh, there are a number of times where products get released and I'll get a call from a client saying, it turns out this feature is really important and people are liking it, but we released it a year ago. Well, it's too late. You've got to, you've got to catch it at the front end of it. Uh, there's the strategic direction of a company is very important as well. You want to make uh, IP an important part of it. You want to make sure that you capture that IP. So if, if it comes from the top down, that will drive other points within the company to capture it. The big thing is, is not to forget your external motivators for getting IP. So you don't necessarily have to file for protection of what you're doing. You may want to file for protection of what your competitors are doing because they may be litigious. They may be coming after you. So you want something in your toolbox to block them. So there's, there's a lot of times where you can look at where your competitors' products may not be, may be going, which may be different than yours, but you still don't know they may come after you. So you have to look at other areas outside of your, your business and your industry to make sure that you've got coverage for it. The supplier one is interesting. Uh, probably about 10 years ago, there were stories out of the US of uh, suppliers, um, uh, sorry, customers um, getting uh, protection to stuff that suppliers were using. For the example I heard was Sprint in the, in the US. Um, was buying equipment from certain telecom manufacturers. Sprint started filing patents around technology that their suppliers were giving them. And what they would do is then they would negotiate down licenses saying, okay, I want to buy this product from you, but by the way, I have a patent for you. I can block you from selling from everyone else. So we have to cut a deal. So sometimes looking outside as to what you're buying from other people that maybe you're directing them to innovate from is something to also look at and consider. Uh, another one is acquisitions. You may be able to get IP from acquisitions. Uh, it, it's the way the market is. Startups can generate a lot of IP. You may have opportunity to get some val very valuable patents uh, based upon other companies and their success or their failures. Uh, one of our partners had a story where back in the, the, the boom in, in Ottawa, one of his clients went bankrupt. Uh, they had two patents. Uh, the investors thought they lost all the money. A couple months later, they had a knock on the door from Microsoft saying they wanted to buy the patents and they recouped all their money. So the, the IP assets may outlive the company and they can have value in and of themselves afterwards. 
So how do you build a portfolio? And there's sort of, I, I see three key areas that you have to focus on. And there is, it's a cycle, so planning. You have to plan ahead. Um, planning really involves getting the company moving in the right direction, getting everyone on board of the importance of it, getting on board as to what this process is and getting it part of the business objective. You gotta generate the IP, you gotta get filed, you gotta get it issued, and then you gotta manage it. And managing it means something different to every, every type of company. So what, what is planning? And, and if there's one takeaway from this, this is probably the most important from my experience in dealing with companies, is, is, this is this is the part that you have to get in your mind, you have to get everyone on board in terms of how do we get this IP out of the company. So big thing is have a policy internally of how you're gonna, um, what you're gonna do with IP, how you're gonna generate the IP, uh, how you're gonna capture it, and what you're gonna do with it. You want this part of personal objectives and people's plans. If if you have an engineer and he doesn't know that he has to generate patents or patents are part of his job, he's always gonna focus on delivering the product. That doesn't mean you have to redirect him on, on getting patents issued, but it has to make it known that he is measured against it and the, the management is measured against generating IP. You wanna have an education process. There are a lot of, I don't want to say fallacies, but a lot of misconceptions of what patents are and how they're useful to a company internally. Uh, a lot of people are pro-open source, so they don't think they should talk about it. A lot of people, a lot of engineers are very big to think, well, anyone could have thought of this, but that's not necessarily true. A lot of people will put down the work that they're doing, so you have to be able to um, convince people that this is an important process. You want to have a filing strategy. Uh, you want to know where your competition is. You want to know where... Uh, your market is and you want to make sure that you have a filing strategy because the cost can be significant. Uh, I'd love to take your money, I'd love to grow your patent flow, but at the same time you got to be smart about it and you don't want to expend it. A, a patent is uh, an entity that will grow on its own over time. It's something that will live for 20 years. You'll be paying for it for 20 years. So before you start down that road you want to know what your strategy is going to be of how you move forward with it. You want to know what the landscape is for the market. You want to know uh, what your competitors are doing. If you're in a litigious market, you, you want to protect yourself. You want to be ready for what people come, uh, might come after you. And you got to have a budget. Uh, budgeting is a long-term process. Uh, it's something that if you say, I'm going to generate five patents a year, it, it grows over time. So you want to make sure you're, you understand how you're going to use that. So once you have, the, uh, you're collecting information, you've got uh, information disclosure forms from your inventors, you've got a, hopefully a patent committee where people review and decide which ones are the worth, uh, patents are worth going for, you got to prepare the application. That's where I come in. I may be involved in the patenting and the planning side, but I'm definitely involved in the generating side. So you, you want to have a process for streamlining. The big thing about generating is you want to make it easy on the inventors, even though um, it hopefully is a, a fairly painless process. It can be difficult and you need to have inventors involved and you want to make sure that, that uh, you have someone that can work with them and the internal processes aren't an undue burden to them. You want to manage the prosecution as you go through. Uh, as I said, it's a long process. Things change. You want to make sure that you're reevaluating your product mix, that your products that you're selling and your patent portfolio as you go along. Uh, patent uh, non-practicing entities or trolls, so to speak, it, this is what they do. So they file a patent, they look and see what else is happening around. I had one client who received a troll letter, received a patent. They responded back and said, thanks, but we don't infringe because of X. We then got another letter from the patent troll saying, great, we filed a continuation application now saying that. We will be calling you again. So you have to do that with your own portfolio. You have to make sure that you know that you're managing it in relation to what you have. Just because you filed it, just because it issued, you just don't stick it on a shelf. You have to know what is going on with it. Again, that comes to you have to adapt as the market changes. Uh, you have to be willing to groom your portfolio. Uh, some people treat these like babies and they don't want to be done. They don't want to uh, give them up as time goes on, but you have to know when the value isn't there anymore and knowing when you have to uh, uh, eliminate patents that aren't of value to it or sell patents off or find other ways of le leveraging them that may not be core to your business. The management part. Uh, this is where Michael would come in. Uh, Enforcement, licensing, marketing, using it as a marketing tool, use it to influence standards. Uh, this is a very common thing too. Because you have a patent, you may have, your industry may have standards bodies that you want to leverage it to. So you want to you find a way of getting your IP into those standards so you have more benefit to the market going forward. And you want to use it to exhibit market share. As I said too, managing may not, maybe just 
reevaluating occasionally. You may not have to enforce it. You may not have to license it, but you have to be ready to have it with it. You have to have that insurance policy in place before you move ahead with it. So when do you file a patent and what makes you want to file a patent? When you have an invention disclosure, you want to be able to evaluate the technology and how you're going to use it. And there's a, there's a many factors that come in and, and the only one that would, wouldn't be on its cost wouldn't be on its own. You basically have to have know what you're getting into. So the, the breadth of what the patent might be, how it maps to your existing products or how it maps to your competitors products to design around. So if you get a patent for something and you have one very specific implementation but your competitor can easily design around it, it may not be worth actually doing it. Um, you want to know what else is around it and you want to know how enforceable it is. If you can't enforce it then, then it's, it's not necessarily a value, it might be more of a marketing value to have that patent. And you want to know what jurisdiction you're, you're going into that that what type of claims you have protection for. Each country is a little bit different. The US is a bit more agreeable on software. Europe is not so agreeable on software. Um, each, each country has different issues that you have to evaluate. The big thing about filing strategy too is knowing where you're gonna enforce it, where your customers are, where your competitors are, where your competitors' customers are. Because if you have a competitor customer and you can sue them and they're never gonna be your customer, that might be more leverage against the, the customer or the, the, uh, your competitor. Portfolio maintenance. Uh, as I said before, you want to groom and adapt it, you want to manage the cost, and you really want to identify important inventions. An, an invention that you filed five years ago may not be as important anymore, and you want to continually rank your inventions as you move forward. Uh, this is something some companies don't necessarily do all that well, is that you want to know uh, where your, your key IP and technology is. Because if you're, not, if you're not grooming your patents or you're not uh, identifying stuff going forward, you'll forget about them and you won't know when someone's infringing. You don't, won't, won't know what tools that you have. IBM, uh, in their portfolio, they actually rank all their patents. So they basically classify each of them. So one of them is going to be core to their technology, they're going to enforce it. Two is going to be they're going to cross-license it, they'll give it to the industry. Three is called a, a basically a, a filing cabinet patent, which might be either cross-licensing or if someone comes up to them and says, hey, you're infringing my 10 patents, they'll come back and say, you're, you're infringing my 100 patents. So it really depends on, on the importance to your business and, and where they fit into it. This is a key thing to remember, and, and we run into it now, especially in this day and age, is, is with a lot of collaboration with outside companies and contractors, is you need to know ownership. Who owns the technology? Just because someone in your company brought up the, the idea or brought up the invention disclosure, they may have collaborated with someone externally, you may have external contractors, uh, you may have joint development agreements. You need to have that all ironed out because that will come back to haunt you later on down the road. Um, and a more interesting one is government employees now are an issue in Canada. Uh, the recent court decision where uh, someone was on the reserve list and developed a uh, patent for a, a sheltering system and he sued D&D over it because they went to another manufacturer. D&D's defense was, you are a government employee, you're obligated to uh, request approval from the minister, and, he, and they said he didn't, so it, it potentially invalidated his patent. So there are issues that, like that, you have to clear these things out ahead of time. Co-development is becoming a bigger issue now in that as companies work together. Um, the biggest thing I can say about co-development is make sure you have the agreement in writing ahead of time of how it's gonna happen and move forward with it particularly as in companies when uh, management changes, people changes, that corporate history, corporate memory leaves, and then you're at a point where one company has a patent, they don't know who to talk to with the other company, and they don't know what to do with the patent. And it works both ways, and that one company may decide to abandon the patent and not, and not take the cost, and the other one will. So you wanna make sure you have that upfront, you know who owns it, what rights you have to it, and what impedances you might have in, uh, going forward with it. The other key thing to remember is inventors. Uh, they are the most important people besides me and Michael. Uh, they're the ones that have to come up with the ideas. Uh, and they have to be, you have to develop a culture within the company of innovation. You have to show that they are being respected for what they are doing. Um, patents are very good of recognizing innovation within a company. Uh, it's great to have a plaque for, for an inventor after they got something uh, issued and, and, and make a, a present big deal about it. Uh, and it provides recognition with it. It provides something tangible to the company to show that they are respected and that this is a company that innovates. 
A lot of companies have, um, depending on your size of the companies, may have an innovation program. So inventors will be compensated for uh, generating information disclosure or, or, or writing up an invention, and then they'll be compensated when the patent gets filed and compensated when the patent issues. Uh, it doesn't take a lot to motivate inventors to do that, but that's sort of a, a side perk that gets them interested in, in, what, in generating IP and actually uh, moving forward with it. You want to have some caveats on it. Uh, I've seen cases in certain companies where it's been abused and all of a sudden you've got a whole bunch of invention disclosures from the same inventor and he's figured a way to kind of game the system to get stuff out there to, to be rewarded for it. But it's a way that you have to have to build into the corporate culture that you've got IP that, that, um, that is important to the business and is, is successful moving forward. Actually, one thing I want to add there too is make sure you have uh, IP agreements in your employment contracts. Hopefully everyone does. If you don't, you want to make sure you have it because you may, not have the, you may not have the rights to your inventor's IP that you think you do and you want to make sure you have a good employment lawyer that, that has vetted those IP contracts to make sure that you have it. The last part is enforcement. Uh, you want to watch the marketplace. You want to know what's going on. You don't want to just stick these in a, in a, in a filing cabinet and just let them get dust on them because then you haven't spent your money. Uh, well, you want to make sure that you have, uh, you, you know what's going on, you want to know as things changes, and you want to be aware as, as threats come up. So if, if your legal department gets a letter from someone threatening that you're infringing it, you want to make sure that you know that you have something to, to um, uh, defend against. And you want to reevaluate your portfolio. Uh, because of the costs involved, you want to make sure you're always monitoring what you're going on, what's going on. You want to um, make sure the team knows what IP you have, because there may be other areas that your IP is useful outside of what you do. So sometimes you can get a patent, for example, uh, Rockstar. Uh, I think the, the key patent that Rockstar enforced against Google was not core to Nortel's product line. It wasn't part of a Nortel division, and it turned out to be the most valuable patent they had. So they, you have to really mine that technology to see, see what you can use. And the last part is, is you gotta contact the litigator. You gotta know when to, when to call Michael and sort of say, okay, we've got a problem, we need to do something with it, or we're, our rights are being infringed and we have to enforce it. So the big things to remember is, is sort of the key aspect. You gotta plan, you gotta generate, you gotta manage. If you, if you don't plan, the other two won't happen. And, and planning up front, like any other part of your business, is the most important part. Uh, you wanna build it into your culture and you wanna make sure that, that uh, you stay on top of it. Do you wanna save it to the end? We'll get you going. All right, well, thank you, Mark. Um, I'm gonna now move on to defensive IP strategies. And specifically, I'm gonna talk about defensive strategies from a patent enforcement point of view and defensive strategies from uh, trade secret protection point of view, so internal uh, strategies for your company and protecting your trade secrets. Just a little bit of um, context, I'd say, and picking up a bit on what Mark presented on with respect to some of the companies that are very active and, and how they see value in IP. This graph shows the, uh, the split between intangible assets and tangible assets within S&P 500 companies. So intangible assets being the bricks and mortar of a company versus the intangible assets, things like IP, trademarks and patents. And as you can see, a very small proportion of company value was in IP in the uh, mid-1970s, and that has completely changed up until 2015, where it's uh, between 80 and 90 percent of a company's value is at least these S&P 500 companies in, uh, in their IP. Also, uh, in terms of, uh, just to set the stage a bit, um, how active are companies in the patent area? Well, if we look at the United States, which is the most active uh, uh, patent office in the world, we have uh, in the early 90s uh, patent filings in terms of uh, lawsuits as well as uh, patents granted in the United States Patent Office. They were sitting at around um, uh, 100,000 or so patents granted and about 1,000 uh, litigations. And then fast forward to uh, more recently, and especially about five years ago, that those numbers skyrocketed. Companies are aggressive with their patent uh, filings and with their patent enforcement. And looking a little more uh, closely at uh, 09 to 2015, 
um, the spike in patent lawsuits is really quite, quite something. Went from around uh, 2,000 and some, only in 2009, all the way up to over 6,000 in 2013. So very aggressive, and a lot of that was due to non-practicing entities and that business model really taking hold and really um, becoming more prevalent. Um, and so that's what we're seeing in the United States. Canada, just a quick look, actually a little bit different, and I don't know if you can see that very well, but uh, <laughs> light blue is probably not the best color there. But the point there is it's actually been a bit flat in Canada. Um, it's, uh, we're not as, uh, the jurisdiction here is not um, as aggressive when it comes to patent lawsuits or uh, patent trolls uh, coming to Canada and asserting their patents. Uh, what else are we seeing generally in terms of the landscape? Uh, huge valuations on patent portfolios. A few years ago, there was the Nortel patent auction. The uh, portfolio sold for four and a half billion dollars. That was more than the than the uh, the tangible assets combined. Um, there was a twelve and a half billion dollar sale of Motorola to Google, and uh, many have valued the patent portion of that as being the lion's share of that uh, that purchase price. There was a, a billion dollar plus sale uh, of AOL's patent assets to Microsoft, and even in the courts, uh, we're seeing some pretty sizable judgments. Uh, there was the one billion dollar Apple Samsung judgment um, at uh, at first instance on uh, on some patent rights. So pretty heavy valuations, and we're also seeing more players come into the fold. It's not just Apple versus Samsung fighting over patents. We're seeing a lot of patent assertion entities, these are the patent trolls or the NPEs. Um, we're seeing privateers where these are companies that basically uh, are used as, as an outsource by a big company with a patent portfolio that doesn't want to monetize their patents themselves, they outsource that to a privateer. And we're also even seeing investment banks and litigation funders get involved who uh, maybe help out uh, smaller players that maybe don't have the financial resources to go up against a big defendant. Um, or maybe it's a, a big company that just wants to get the cost of litigation off their balance sheet and, and transfer the risk to, uh, to an outside funder. So current landscape is basically uh, that we are, we're in a time, I think, that the business of obtaining patents and enforcing them has never been this complex. Uh, All-time records in terms of filings and, and applications and uh, some huge valuations as well as a lot of uncertainty, and we're seeing a lot of uncertainty, uh, especially in the United States, with some Supreme Court decisions like the Alice case that has called into question uh, business method patents, um, and we're also seeing new techniques for invalidating patents, like the, uh, the post-grant uh, reviews that we have in the United States for invalidating patents. So turning now to uh, patent enforcement risks. Um, there are really two enforcement risks that a company is going to face when it comes to patent assertions. They can be from non-practicing entities or they can be from your competitors. So NPEs, um, they've, they've, they're not, they don't fare well in, in the public, um, in the mainstream, mainstream light. They, they, they get a pretty bad rap and, and in some cases it's, it's deserved. Um, if you go online, you'll see lots of uh, funny pictures and, and cartoons as to what patent trolls are. Um, but generally speaking, are, uh, companies that are either patent assertion entities, so their sole purpose is to acquire patents and then enforce them for licensing revenue, or they could be a non-patent assertion entity. So even a university technically could fall into the category of an NPE because they don't make the product, but they do generate the IP and in some cases will enforce it. Um, the practice of NPEs has actually existed for quite some time and the earliest NPEs were uh, back in the 1800s when there was the, uh, the sewing machine wars and, and the inventor of the sewing machine didn't actually make sewing machines but he has asserted his patents against, uh, against Singer. So why, why are NPEs so uh, popular and, and, and in some cases well positioned to assert their rights? Well, it's because when an NPE sues somebody, the defendant can't really countersue them with any patents that they may have because the NPE is not out there selling any product. They're not competing. And so that gives the NPE um, uh, a position of leverage. And as well, uh, especially when we're talking about the United States, the cost to litigate 
can be in the millions of dollars. The cost to defend the lawsuit can be in the millions of dollars. And a lot of these NPEs will just seek settlements that are uh, below the cost of litigation. And in some cases, they'll only seek nuisance value settlements. So, uh, and this is all despite the fact that there are, there have been a string of court decisions that have come down fairly hard on, on NPEs, or at least the uh, assertion of patents that uh, NPEs typically use, um, and, uh, and also looming patent reform that we may be seeing in the United States. And so uh, all of this, all of these headwinds that NPEs are facing, they're still continuing with their business model, so they still are a risk that you need to, to be mindful of. Um, and generally speaking, the bigger your com company, the more products you're selling, the more uh, money you're making, the bigger the target you're going to have on your back for being uh, uh, ha the subject of an assertion by an NPE. So what do MPEs typically do? Uh, in many cases, they'll send you a demand letter before uh, they'll la launch uh, a lawsuit. And as Mark mentioned, uh, you know, he's had a client, I'm sure he's had multiple clients that have received demand letters from MPEs. And it's typically the first time as a company you're going to get uh, any inkling of any patents uh, owned by this MPE or in some cases ever even heard of the MPE. So what do you do? Um, do you respond and engage or do you ignore and toss the letter in the, in the trash can? Well, you should always follow at least uh, a basic process uh, anytime you receive those kinds of letters. At least initially, um, don't ignore it. Um, Ask some basic questions. Who is the NPE? Um, what are the patents at issue? Are they relevant? Is this an NPE that's completely missed the mark on, on what your business is actually doing? Because there are some NPEs out there that will fire out hundreds or thousands of letters uh, indiscriminately, and they may have completely missed the mark by sending one to you. Um, do the patents relate to products or services that you actually developed and have control over how they are sold or, or used? Or do the patents relate to something you just bought off the shelf, like a photocopier, uh, a Xerox photocopier that you're using in your, in your office, uh, such that maybe there's some sort of agreement that you have that the manufacturer is going to indemnify you if you ever get accused of patent infringement. So look at those factors, see if there's somebody that you can refer the case to to defend it for you, such as a manufacturer that has indemnified you. Um, but in some cases, the, an indemnity is not going to be in place, and you're going to need to deal with, deal with the, uh, the allegations. So uh, consider a number of things. Number one, uh, is this a well-known NPE? Is this somebody that is going to litigate if I don't negotiate? Or is it somebody who's got a reputation of just sending letters, never litigating, and really just uh, is out there fishing for licenses? Consider as well the likelihood of whether you infringe and also consider maybe you've got some smoking gun prior art. Maybe you've got some document to show, for example, your product was publicly sold before the patents owned by the NPE were even filed and that alone could possibly dispose of the case. So always take a holistic approach, look at these initial uh, questions and, and then form a plan for how you're going to, going to respond. Um, so. Where possible, it's great if you can show non-infringement or that their patents are invalid. Uh, you might need to put together detailed claim charts to prove that or to, to really convince the other side that that's the case. Um, you always want to keep the NPE placated and out of court. And to the extent you do get into a discussion on settlement and you're trying to negotiate uh, proper uh, royalty, you always want to look back at the earlier agreements that that NPE entered into with others because those are going to form the anchor for what is going to be a reasonable royalty in any future cases. And then remember, as I mentioned before, the cost to litigate can sometimes be much, much greater than the cost of selling. And, and although it's, you know, it can be painful to negotiate with some of these companies, um, it's uh, sometimes in the end the most cost-effective way to, uh, to proceed. Uh, in some cases, the stakes are very high, and uh, settlements at an early stage without litigation is either not an option or is, is not the best approach, and you're going to want to litigate at least for a little while and uh, push back on the NPE's assertions. So in, in, 
in considering litigation, if you're going to go down that road, there are so many different options you can look at for how you want to go down that road. Maybe the uh, NPE sues you first and drags you into court somewhere and you've got to deal with that. But that doesn't mean you don't have any other options. You could, for example, challenge their patents in uh, patent office post-grant proceedings. Right now in the United States, the inter-parties review is very popular and is uh, has uh, been referred to by some as the, uh, um, the patent death squads because a lot of patents that were granted by the U.S. Patent Office are being invalidated after they've been granted in these inter-parties review proceedings. And so uh, look at those options. Maybe that's a way you can get leverage over the NPE by dragging them into a jurisdiction or into a forum that uh, they don't want to be in. If it's an international dispute, look at forum shopping. Um, one of the things that I do a lot of is uh, gather and study data on win rates in different countries. For example, uh, uh, in the United States, in the Eastern District of Texas, it's a very favorable place if you're a patentee, whereas uh, for years in the UK, um, it was a very unfavorable place if you were a patentee. You only had maybe a 20% win rate. And so you want to look at all the different places where maybe you could go to invalidate the, uh, the NPE's patent rights, where you're going to stand a better chance than where they may have uh, dragged you. If there are other accused infringers, you want to try and join forces with them, um, share in costs, maybe share in defense. And uh, to the extent that there's any concern with things like treble damages, which is uh, triple damages in the United States, you want to make sure you get the proper opinion letters in place so that uh, you're not exposed to that. Exploit weaknesses in the NPE's business model. Typically, NPEs run their cases with uh, law firms on contingency. Uh, they want to have a quick settlement uh, and, uh, and something that is, is low cost. Well, uh, maybe you, you work the, against them on that and you, you drag out the litigation and exploit um, some of their weaknesses and try and drive their price down. And in some cases, companies will adopt a, a no negotiation policy. They simply don't want to be known as that company that always settles with patent trolls, and so they always fight back. So turning to competitor patent assertions, probably the most, uh, one of the most popular or well-known ones uh, recently is the Apple-Samsung uh, patent wars. And they're ongoing. Um, it's, uh, I believe they settled in, in most countries except the United States, things are ongoing there. Um, what motivates competitor patent assertions? It's primarily market share preservation. Um, that's in contrast to NPEs where they're, they're just seeking um, damages. When it comes to competitors, oftentimes you're trying to actually get them completely removed from the market with whatever that product or service is uh, because you're going for a permanent injunction at the end of the day. So the risks when we're talking about competitor assertions are actually somewhat greater than in NPE cases because not only could you be hit with damages, but you could also have your product uh, pulled from the market. So a few different things for minimizing the risk of a competitor patent assertion. Um, first, you want to have good non-infringement arguments. Second, you want to have strong invalidity arguments. And third, and Mark touched on this a bit, you want to have a strong patent portfolio of your, of your own for counterclaim purposes. So I'll talk about each of them. When it comes to non-infringement, you need to know who your competitors are and what their patent assets are. And when you've identified their patent assets, you want to identify which ones of those could be of potential concern to your products or services because they'll probably have some patents that you don't care about, but then there will be others that maybe read on or uh, partially read on what you're doing. So identify the ones that are of concern and with those you want to start developing a strategy for minimizing your risks uh, of infringement and the first thing you can do, uh, sort of the low-hanging fruit if, if you will, is to design around if that's not something that's going to be too disruptive in the company. If you can design around the patent and avoid infringement then that's a pretty clear uh, way of avoiding that, uh, that risk. Um, to the extent infringement or design around is not, uh, is not feasible, then you want to look at invalidity. And so with invalidity, uh, that is where you, are, uh, you have evidence that the patent that your competitor has is invalid because somebody else, either you or a third party, 
actually publicly disclosed or used the invention before the patent was filed. And so you want to catalog and make sure you keep good records of any prior art that a third party um, may have uh, disclosed and as well to the extent that you had disclosures related to your product um, whether that be uh, manuals or old web pages things like that keep good records of that because that could come in very handy down the road if you ever need it as evidence in a case to show what you were doing predates um, what the patent uh, when the patent was filed um, it's also important to have evidence not just of what the, the prior art document is or what it discloses but also that it was indeed publicly available and a lot of times that gets overlooked it just gets assumed well it was publicly available but you actually need to prove that you need to show that something was publicly available um, and in some cases maybe you want to look at just a practice the prior art approach you want to um, basically uh, steer clear of anything that could be considered an infringement risk and just do things that are already in the public domain because if you're doing what's in the public domain then uh, you're much less likely to be accused of infringing someone's subsequent patent. And then portfolio strategies. Um, there's that expression, the best defense is a good offense or, or mad, mutually assured destruction. So that is, uh, if, if you've got an arsenal of patent assets and your competitor's got an arsenal of patent assets, you could have World War III over uh, those portfolios, asserting them against each other and spend millions of dollars on, uh, on litigation, or you could cross license and, uh, and everybody walks away and saves a lot of money. And, and that's often why companies like the Googles and the IBMs and everyone uh, builds these portfolios so that when one of their competitors comes knocking, they've got, uh, they've got some leverage for, for counterclaim purposes. So, uh, like Mark said, it's like an insurance policy. It's a strong deterrent against somebody coming after you because they know if they come after you, you're going to fire back. Um, so there's lots of ways to, to really build your portfolio and keep it strong. Uh, working with people like Mark, you want to use continuations and divisionals and other different uh, uh, measures that are in the patent office to keep your claims um, pending and so that you can craft them around what your competitors are doing. And just a real world example of, of this, a client that, uh, um, that we've worked with, they were a market leader uh, in a particular uh, product area. Um, they had a competitor that entered the market with some disruptive new technology, some new wireless technology, and uh, some new green technology that was real game changing for this particular product space. Um, the client knew they had to go that way as well. They knew that that's the way the, the market was going. They had to follow but they needed to minimize their risk with respect to this new competitor that just came along and had this big portfolio it was building over uh, that covered all of their, their new innovations. So what did they do? Uh, first of all, they designed around wherever they could to minimize risks uh, on as many patents as possible there. Uh, the remaining patents that were of concern, they built up uh, prior art records and, and got everything in line in case they ever needed to use that in any future uh, lawsuit to defend themselves on those patents. And then thirdly, they built their own portfolio with forward-looking uh, innovations that eventually the competitor themselves started putting in their products and started using. And so now, today, if there ever was a lawsuit by the competitor against our client, they would have some assets to fire back with. And so far, so good. The client has escaped litigation, all the while the competitor has sued others in the market that weren't as forward-looking with their planning and uh, their, their infringement avoid, avoidance. So just for the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, trade secrets. So this is kind of the second part uh, of, of defensive IP strategies. We all know trade secrets are, are basically secrets. They are things like recipes, like the Coke uh, formula or the, the KFC recipe. Um, but it really is a broad definition. It's basically any information of commercial value that an organization or individual doesn't want revealed to somebody else. Um, what makes a trade secret a secret? It's gotta be obviously a secret, kept confidential. There should be some commercial value associated with it. And 
most importantly, and what I'll be talking about, is having reasonable measures in place to keep it a secret. Because you find yourself having to enforce a trade secret in litigation, the court is going to take a very close look at how you treated the information. Did you have the measures in place to keep it a secret? If you can fit within that criteria, then you've got your trade secret and you can keep it forever. Um, but the moment that it gets uh, released to the public, either somebody figures out how to reverse engineer it, or maybe someone discloses it in, in a document, then the trade secret protection is lost. So examples of, of trade secrets uh, can be business secrets like customer lists, or it can be technical things like computer programs, source code, things like that. Um, wide variety of things can be trade secrets. Just a note about departing employees, and, and for some this is a bit of a surprising, a um, couple of surprising stats here. Uh, a little bit dated, but still relevant, I think. Um, nearly half of Canadian employees don't believe their organization would actually uh, go after them if they took trade secrets with them. And nearly 60% of departing employees have indeed taken confidential information with them. So. Uh, a bit surprising, um, so all the more reason to be very careful about how you protect your trade secrets. So what do you do? First of all, you got to know what the secrets are, and you got to know where they are. And obviously, as I've said before, you got to keep them a secret. And how do you do that? You have non-disclosure agreements, you have company policies, procedures, and I'll talk about a couple of those in a moment. Um, record preservation is really key in the event that there is a breach because you're going to want to uh, move quickly if there's a breach. Uh, you may want to get an injunction. Uh, you may want to get into court very quickly and you need to have the, the evidence to show what the trade secret is and, uh, and that you had kept it uh, confidential in the company to satisfy the court that this deserves, this deserves being protected. And, and in some cases, maybe you want to consider converting the trade secret to a patent. Um, if you think that you know maybe some person or a group of people are going to leave the company and they have a lot of uh, know-how with them and they're going to take that with them somewhere else, maybe you take that IP and put it in a patent application so that it's protected no matter what uh, those people do down the road. So what are some practical measures uh, for, for protecting uh, your confidential information and, and more specifically for showing that you are keeping uh, that information confidential and you have those reasonable measures in place for doing that. Probably the most important thing is, is an NDA and that goes for both your employees and any third parties that you may be dealing with such as uh, consultants or other. Uh, um, you want to have policies in place that deal with confidentiality and security of information. Um, you want to make sure you've got proper building security in place, proper IT security in place, keep everything that's confidential uh, locked down and that includes any dealings you have with cloud providers. Um, you want to have strong labeling practices for labeling hard copy documents and electronic documents as confidential where applicable. Um, technology uh, systems and equipment use policies so things like uh, you know laptops taken outside of the business uh, public statements and social media policies make sure that there are strong policies in place about what people can say publicly and their use of social media, obviously not disclosing confidential information. A code of conduct for employees is also helpful um, and having employees sign that, it's a, an extra layer of uh, protection and an extra bit of evidence that you can eventually show a judge that uh, you've taken the, the protection of, of the IP seriously. Um, and just a few others, you know, really uh, courts do look at how much a company emphasizes the importance of confidentiality within the company, um, how much a company polices and monitors their systems for, uh, for compliance with their confidentiality uh, restrictions. You want to have, where possible, uh, some exit interviews or termination agreements to reaffirm uh, an employee's obligations of confidence. And generally speaking, you take a need-to-know approach to confidential information and its dissemination within the organization and ask yourself, does somebody really need to know uh, this or have access to this and uh, control the flow of information in that sense. 
So thank you very much for coming, and uh, hopefully we uh, will see you again at uh, future seminars.